morning and welcome to our latest virtual roundtable brought to you by Development Finance Today and kindly sponsored by ADAIR and FRP Restructuring Advisory. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Beth Fisher, editor at Medianet, the publisher of online titles Development Finance Today and Bridging and Commercial and also the bi-monthly print Bridging and Commercial magazine. Today, we will be discussing what to do when things go wrong in development and how to avoid the pitfalls. Earlier this week, Boris Johnson set out, set out how life will return close to normal in England on the 19th of July. The property market, however, is far from normal. The stamp duty holiday has fueled transactions in the race to space, so much so that in June, annual house price growth rose to 13.4%, the highest level since November 2004. Now that the first stage of the stamp duty holiday has ended, it will be interesting to see if we will start to see a house price correction, especially as other government support schemes come to an end. And um, we'd like to discuss what developers, lenders and brokers need to be aware of in order to react. Latest PMI data for June found that overall construction activity and the use of subcontractors has increased at the fastest pace since 1997. However, the market's recovery from the pandemic could be threatened by price increases and a shortage of building materials as a result of severe delays with shipping and haulage, especially for products sourced from the EU. Many have cited the limited supply of cement, concrete, plaster, steel, timber and roof tiles resulting in rapid cost inflation and lengthening lead times. Escalating cost pressures and the concerns around labour availability as a result of Brexit could hamper optimism in the sector going forward and mean that developers need to take out finance on longer terms, which will compound the land loan. Therefore, it has never been more vital for developers to be able to identify and resolve risks in their own projects as soon as possible, especially as profit margins get tighter and project viability is heavily scrutinised. While COVID-19 has brought many challenges to the development landscape, it has also brought opportunities. Land that was earmarked for office development, for example, could be repurposed for residential use, while vacant office space could be redeveloped into something better suited to our changing environments. Liquidity has also surged, potentially due to a redirection of funds from the commercial sector into residential, as investors look for stronger returns. While pricing and leverage has started to come back to pre-pandemic levels, lenders will likely be building in how the end of government support schemes will likely impact the refinance market and in turn exit viability over the next 12 to 18 months. Therefore, we hope today's discussion will explain what developers should be preparing for and including in their proposals when looking to secure funding and how they should approach their funder if anything goes wrong. We'd also like to know some useful advice from monitoring surveyor on common issues that they are currently seeing and also where the main legal pitfalls are in development contracts. Joining me are a fantastic group of experts in the development finance market and now is the perfect time for me to hand this over to them so they can all spend around two minutes introducing themselves and I'd like to start with Richard please. Hi uh, I'm Richard Payne I'm a director at Adair Consultancy. I'm head of the project monitoring team. Um, I am by training a qualified QS, um, but I did have a, a holiday from the QS world uh, for a few years when I was lending money under various platforms, uh, um, BLME, uh, Oblix, uh, Singer and Friedlander and others. Um, but I've now returned to uh, the construction advisory and consultancy world and um, acting for uh, many lenders out there, uh, uh, always wanting to act for more, um, and uh, dealing with uh, projects the length and breadth of the country. Um, the vast majority at the moment are in uh, the residential sector, but that just reflects the market. Thanks, Richard. And Phil? So, uh, morning, everybody. So, yes, I'm Phil Reynolds. I'm a partner at FRP Advisory. I, I'm a restructuring partner with the firm. So, I deal with businesses that get into stress or distress. Um, I'm the kind of person that the lender will call in when they have concerns over development to obviously check what's going on, see if um, that lender is willing to put more money out or whether they want to take enforcement action. So, Hopefully I won't act as the, the bogeyman on this call, but uh, 
hopefully some of the points I see when things go wrong will help inform our discussion about how to make things go right. So. Thanks, Phil. John? Hi, I'm uh, John King. I work for Commercial Acceptances um, as a Senior Lending Manager. So I've been lending funds and uh, um, facilities for probably the last 15 years um, at a couple of different banks and I've been at Commercial Acceptances for the last three years. We tend to look at residential properties, um, be it bridging, re refurbishments or, or kind of smaller, smaller end developments and we tend to stick in London and the South East. Um, as a company, we're wholly owned by um, Close Brothers, so that means any kind of mid or, or larger development will we'll interact with them and, and bring colleagues from that side. So we can look at real um, developments for, from any size up, be it from ourselves to, to our colleagues. Thanks for that. And Trevor? Yes, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Trevor McClymon. I'm a development director at a small uh, residential um, developer. Um, we operate um, in London and the South East. Uh, my training is that um, I'm a town planner um, and also I've undertaken um, sort of master's studies in urban sustainability and I have a keen interest in um, ESG and how that's currently impacting the um, development landscape. Thank you. Brilliant. And Alex? Yeah, thank you. Good morning. My name is Alex Polopidis. I'm a real estate finance partner at uh, London law firm Roslyn King, where I've been for about 10 years. Roslyn King is a legal 500 listed firm that does a lot of real estate and real estate finance work, where we act for lenders, investors and developers. We also have a disputes resolutions team that does a lot of work in the same space, so real estate and, and finance. I'm actually a finance lawyer by background, but obviously through the work that I do in development finance, um, pick up a lot of uh, points to deal with um, in the underlying contracts and the actual issues that arise. In terms of the funding work, I also get involved at the distressed end where you might have pre-enforcement or post-enforcement action, which can sometimes lead to insolvency related processes, mainly receiverships and administration. And uh, echoing what other people have said, um, in the past 18 months, a lot of the work we've been doing is residential-led. So a lot of schemes to do with also um, bridging and development lending into that space and sort of variants. So even things like service departments, student, I kind of consider those kind of similar. All of that with long dated time frames have been coming to the fore more and things look pretty good. Great, thanks Alex. So that's our panellists um, and uh, I just want to remind our audience um, that you can ask questions throughout the discussion um, to either the whole panel or individual panellists um, so you can do so in the chat box on the right of your screen so please do ask questions that you have throughout and um, we'll either ask them during the, the conversation or we'll leave them to the last five to ten minutes of the of the debate. Um, so I to kick off the um, my first question, which is um, I'd like to to ask Richard this, um, which is all about the um, the house price growth, which I mentioned a bit earlier, where it's it's approaching bubble territory, as some may say. Um, what advice would you give to a developer who is looking to buy land or or sites now to ensure their completed schemes remain profitable later down the line? Um, well, the put together some form of uh, risk matrix surrounding the profitability of the scheme uh, against uh, the sale price. So uh, you, the, the sale price, which will no doubt you, you will have taken advice from uh, a valuer uh, at any point, well, that's absolutely fine. And that valuation will be uh, absolutely right for a moment in time. Uh, uh, which is now. However, you're not selling the whatever you're creating, your asset, uh, at that same moment in time, sadly. Uh, and um, it remains to be seen various um, uh, additions to uh, and uh, assistance to sales have come back on. Uh, so, for example, uh, the stamp duty, the, uh, the um, assistance to business, uh, they've all now um, gone the wrong way in terms of sale price. And it remains to be seen, of course, where we're going. Now, uh, no doubt, credit 
functions within lenders will take a, a sensible view, uh, which uh, may not be shared by uh, by necessarily the developer themselves. But it, it's ultimately um, they're they're there to protect your interests, and it would be sensible to be able to prove that you can also make a profit if there is a no growth be a drop in growth of sale prices uh, and see a rise or of interest rates um, because who knows what uh, economic uh, action is going to be taken over the next uh, over your build period which is let's say 12 to 18 months um, and uh, if you if you work with a matrix which allows you a 10 percent uh, correction uh, because if they've gone up 14% in the last year, then they could go down 10%, uh, as a, which would still leave a 4% 4, 4 rise over a, over a, uh, a longer period. Um, it, it might be sensible that to prove that you can all still make 15% profit in that period of time. And if not, that will always determine the uh, purchase price, the residual purchase price of the land that you're buying. If you already own the land, then, uh, then that's a different kettle of fish. But if you're buying land, make sure that the end game works under a series of risk uh, profiles and, and price profiles, and you, the, your development is price sensitive uh, and, and still works under various pricing scenarios. Trevor, would you agree that you 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 are now having to look at all of those those scenarios in case the the property market changes? Um, yes, uh, but I, I, I think the, you know just to answer, just to look at the question a little bit more, it's about house price growth. So for us as a developer, and if I was advising a, another developer, I think there are probably three key things to to underscore the idea of the matrix that Thomas Richard just outlined. Obviously, one is to know your market. And the product and the audience. Um, uh, you know, it's not a simply a case of you can do so you must. You have to know what you are doing. Um, are you good at it? Um, is this a new area for you? Um, are you well established in this field? All of these things, all these elements, give um, confidence to a lender who is, you know, who is trying or wanting to um, support you. The second layer. To all of this is um, you have to have some understanding of costs and how those might be controlled. Um, you know, lots of developers simply rely on contract to hand on all the risk to the contractor. Um, on paper, that sounds fine. In reality, that's not so easy. I mean, um, events happen, things change. A contract while it covers a wide sort of remit it doesn't capture every issue and there are new issues happening to us um, which weren't around two five even seven years ago so costs and understanding costs is quite a, a big piece for me um, the other issue also is to understand the sort of wider context, you know, um, to be a developer, it's it's not a science, it's more of an art, but there are some real groundings that um, the very best developers have, um, which make them successful. And one of those, as I've said, is to understand the bigger picture, you know, what is inflation doing? What does that mean for our industry? What does that mean for cost control, cost of materials? Uh, what does that mean for house price inflation? You know, what's the differential between the growth of house prices and the growth in the cost um, of developing a house for sale to the market? I mean, obviously those two things track each other and it's quite important to understand what that, um, how that works and what is the relationship and if and is it something that you need to be really focused on then you also have to understand what is the demand of the buyers um, 
you know, uh, are, you know, is it right for you to be focusing on uh, two bed, two bathroom apartments, or is two bed, one bath? I know these are quite small and granular things, but these things often outflow into the saleability of your product. And of course, that's what's key. And then I suppose, um, as thirdly on that point, it's really to understand who your competitors are and what your competitors are doing. Um, I, you know, I, I think many people think being a developer is something that um, is probably glamorous, maybe unique, without understanding that there are many more developers in the market. Um, understanding what your offering is against what your competitor is, is very, very important. That's how you that's how you distinguish your product in, in exactly the same way as when we go to a retail store. You know, we know there are five supermarkets, might be more, but you know some offer a different level of service or product. Um, and whether that's notional or real, it attracts a certain type of buyer. And that's the same approach that a developer has to um, develop and understand in order to be successful in the current um, landscape. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Some, some, some really useful advice there and points that you know, doesn't just um, revolve around price, which is obviously a key thing there, but it's also you know, about expertise and knowing your market and offering compared to, to who else is, who else is uh, uh, building yeah. in, in, in your kind of local areas. Absolutely. Um, John, what would you, how are you currently approaching and, and assessing funding proposals from developers um, who are looking to buy land or sites at the moment, um, considering the kind of volatile uh, price market at the moment in, ha in housing? Yeah, I, I, I probably agree with the sentiments of, of Richard and, and Trevor there. And you, you, you do need to stress it up and stress it downwards in terms of the build, uh, in terms of the, in terms of sales, as Richard quite rightly says, it can go 10% up, um, can easily go 10% down. Um, and, and, and kind of just feeding off what Trevor was saying as well, inflation in terms of build costs and build materials is something key that you need to look at. The, the other point that I'd probably add looking from the banking and the, the lending side of it would also be another kind of section that can eat into your profit would be the length of your project and the, the interest and the fees that you have to pay. So when you're first looking at your project, have that conversation very early on with your monitoring surveyor, with your lenders to say, okay, I think it's an eight month build, but I'm gonna build in 10 months. So, so I've got a bit of kind of movement in there. And you know upfront how much your interest is gonna cost. Because the, 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 the worst thing is you come to the end, your 20% profit is now 15%, uh, profit levels, um, sorry, um, sales have, have gone down as well. And before you know it, your, your profits eroded. So. Um, program is, is one of the key points for me. We, we've also seen um, over the last 12 months or so that the, the development market has experienced um, record high levels of liquidity. We, we, we hear it a lot from brokers that there's never been so much cash in this in this market. Um, why do you think this is and do you think uh, the, the appetite from lenders will, will last? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, there, there always seems to be another lender or more investors into the market and and we keep looking behind us thinking that that people will fail and, and to date nobody nobody has so it'll be interesting if somebody does fail what that does to the rest of the market if, if people it jitters or if the good liquidity continues to continues to roll um i think a lot of it is tech led um a lot of it is investors both individuals um and institutional people all looking at where they can place their money and where they can get good returns. Uh, on the face of it, property, everyone understands property. Most people live in a house or own a house. Um, that They believe they, they know what the fundamentals of, of property look like. Um, so it's a very easy one to put your money in and, and you feel very safe. Uh, again, it would just be interesting as bill costs go up, um, as people struggle through COVID, through Brexit, if there are a few bumps in the road and developments and a few foul, what, what does that do to the market? Um, I, I think that's one of the key questions. For me at the moment, li liquidity is strong. I, I think it will be for a foreseeable future. Um, but uh, yeah, none of us have that crystal ball, unfortunately. 
Do you think that the, the, the high levels of liquidity are spread over the development market in all the different kind of se uh, sectors and, and subsectors? Because um, very much like the bridging market, you know, you've got a lot of institutional money there, but they're all kind of chasing the same sort of business. Um, so do you, think, do you feel that the, um, the development space is also a bit fragmented in terms of where that liquidity is, is ending up? Look, everyone wants to uh, put their money into, into lower risk developments. Um, so I, th I think there is a lot of kind of key money there. Um, I oft often see a lot of kind of exit products and uh, a lot of banks bringing exit products out. And again, that, that's bringing down the risk because it's a, it's a built product. You know what you've got, you get evaluation at the time. So I think at the lower risk and the, uh, and the end of the development, you're seeing a lot of investor money. Um, haven't seen too many at the kind of the MES level or the, the higher loan to GDV levels. Um, so that, that's probably a bit of a niche in the market where people can look to if you understand property and you, you want to put your money into them, um, that, that's maybe a place to go. But uh, at the moment, it's at them, them kind of two, two other ends um, is, is what I'm seeing. Thanks, John. Yeah, I, I, I've def I, I would agree. And I am starting to see development lenders, especially more on the, the boutique lender side, yeah, starting to absolutely. up their loan to GDBs. And um, Trevor, are you, uh, what, are you, what are you seeing in terms of securing funding and are you feeling that there's um, a, a large appetite to lend still? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, I think this is a question of two halves for me. I mean, I, I um, sadly, I, I've been around since 1979 in one form or another in the space and I've seen several uh, recessions in the space and with each one the development landscape changes um, it becomes more developed it becomes deeper and the actual um, events over the uh, development cycle they become faster um, so you have more sophistication in the market hence the attraction of more money there is more financial engineering, which shows you that there are gaps in the market, which allows um, finance platforms to come up. And I think it's really important to understand the difference between a finance platform and a, a banking platform. You know, they're very different. I mean, John will know more than I would on this. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of the platform, you know, these are often funded or underwritten by money from a family office, um, you know, high net worth individuals, um, as well as very large um, as corporates. Um, and just seeing the, the response to the market from those two avenues, it is quite different. There is clearly more money out there, real estate, is a big part of the UK economy. Again, it's important to understand, you know, where where do we sit? I mean, I, I think on average, um, development and construction is something like the third or fourth largest sector in the UK economy. Um, most of our wealth um, as UK um, uh, citizens is stored and measured in real estate. You know, anyone that makes money in another sector is very quick to invest some of that money into real estate. Um, we have a huge international exposure and attraction that's underpinned by our very clear and transparent legal system. It's very, it's also underpinned by how liquid our market is, how easy it is to transact in our market. And um, that's not going to change. And, and all of that is undergirded by the fact that the cost of funds, you know, the cost of money, and again, John, is an expert in this far more than I am. Um, it's quite low and looks, just looking out, um, you know, um, the cost of money will be low for some time. Thanks, so, triple, so Trevor, there's just an interesting point from my perspective, because yeah. you say like, you look at back prior recessions and prior issues, you know, it was a smaller lender pool and you could understand their behaviors a little bit more. Uh, a yeah. lot of the new parties coming in when there's distress it's quite interesting you get the ones i want to support or the ones that wants to exit almost immediately and then there's yeah. a whole chain yeah. of other lenders who will all come rushing in Absolutely. behind them and, uh, <laughs> that makes you know the job when you're trying to keep a, a development going uh, somewhat more tricky when you don't really Absolutely. understand the motivations of some of the stakeholders 
very so true, Phil. It's very true. Uh, developers should be preparing for and, and including in their proposals when when trying to secure funding for their schemes. Um, even though there's 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 a lot of liquidity in the market right now, um, as you know, as John John alluded to there, that there's that a lot of this cash is, is looking for um, low low risk development. So what do you think developers are now having to include that they might not have had to do 18 months or so ago? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, a couple of points that have already been raised. I mean, one of the issues I see when I'm asked by lenders to review a proposal is really, you know, particularly now is making sure those contingencies are in place. As John said, you know, you want a realistic time frame and you want to understand what the costs and issues would be if that's exceeded. Um, what we're seeing at the moment particularly is in terms of material delays, you know, and actually are they actually being realistic and robust in their assumptions that, you know, <laughs> the materials they need are going to be on site when they need them. Um, a lot of the issues we're finding is when people are saying there's a two, three week delay just because of those issues and the consequent impact. Um, I mean, um, probably John as a, as a lender probably uh, explain a lot more but you know sometimes the quality of, of those proposals I see are really poor you know they don't help themselves uh yeah tying up their management information systems to those proposals you can see how it's been generated how it's been based um and you know a lot of the time we see what almost look like cut and paste proposals you know it's like the one they've done before they've always changed the name on the top and resubmitted it <laughs> so those are the things but um you know a robust credible proposal with appropriate contingency in place for you know, cost inflation material delays staffing issues you know I, I want to see that my developers thought of those issues and have been factored into the proposal the more that's in the more confident i am to say to the lender this looks like a you know a robust proposal to lend to do you say that there's a trend on where those um, uh, poor proposals are coming from? Are they from inexperienced developers? Um, what are you kind of seeing? Sure. Well, I might try and pass that one on to John, I think. Um, I don't, John, in terms of the proposals you see, do you, is there a variability you're seeing at the moment? Um, look, I, I think small to medium builders are probably the the quality is 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 variable. Larger builders, uh, and I'm sure Phil probably sees it, that they've got their act together. But what you might find is um, someone's a builder. They 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 work on a construction site. They then have enough money to build one one unit. A few years later, they build it up two, three, four units. Um, and before you know it, they're a very good builder. They can they've got their kind of standard product. They know what they can build, how much it will cost, and uh, and that they can sell it. But what they've kind of forgot to do is, or, or maybe they're kind of scared to do, is the kind of paperwork side of it. So when someone like a Richard turns up and asks for your bill cost, your program, all your documents, they look at you with a blank face saying, well, I can build it and this is how much it's going to cost. Um, and they just don't have that full proposal alongside it. Um, you, on the opposite side, you get some people who are fantastic at the, at the paperwork side and can't really build. So it, it's, it's kind of personal preference and everyone's different, but quality is, is definitely variable. Is there anything that any kind of party in the transaction can do to help with um, developers who who are kind of struggling on the proposal side, but they have a great team around them and 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 like you say, know how to build and 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 the the actual scheme will be successful. It's just they don't have the the paperwork down. Well, I, I think I think sorry, John. But I think these these things uh, that, that it, again, it's anticipating what the bank is going to ask rather than putting forward something and then waiting for the bank to come back and 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 ask and obviously when i say bank i mean lender or of any form but um if to impress the lender if you have anticipated um what might be asked okay what happens if the time schedule goes extends what uh, we've dealt with that what happens if the costs go up because the materials are late or the material prices themselves go up because of the demand of them i mean there is a great demand for materials which of course not only leads to delays but it leads to an increase in price of those materials um and uh, uh have we thought of that and what happens if the costs go up who's going to uh, pay for the increased costs that go beyond the contingency which is in, in loud in the facility what a lender, what the uh, 
credit team are always going to want is, has this developer got money in his pockets that when we need 50 grand more to pay for this, is he going to be able to pay for it? Because I'm not going to want to increase my facility at the first drop of a hat. I want the developer to be able to pay for that. And so if he has all these things lined up in the proposal as to what he's going to do, uh, then that will be an impressive start to something which invariably is not covered until the lender asks the questions, which is the formula and, you know, OK, we go in, we, we have this and then, the, then they ask the questions. And, and for people like us uh, who are going along and asking for a programme, uh, which has been drawn in about five minutes on a uh, on the most basic um, uh, possible uh, piece of software, um, and actually doesn't have any real consideration. They've got 12 months, and they've just divided the thing into uh, in, into 12 equal sections. Well, that's fine, but um, has an if you have that standard building that looks like any other standard building, fine. Not many do. They all have different things they've got the conservatory built on the back they've got the they've got the underfloor heating to take into consideration etc cetera, etc cetera. so how much consideration of the specific build of the specific um restraints of the site if there are any of the specific area of the country that is being built do, does the developer have knowledge of that area have they built uh, to use a uh, uh, a an, an extreme have they built in bath before Bath being a particularly difficult planning um, uh, borough to be uh, to be building within, and so it's it's how much consideration for all these difficulties has the uh, developer looked at, and and do I have to extract all this information with difficulty from the developer, or is it all there? Is a lot of it there, and I can base my judgment on it? It will leave a better impression with the lender and the, and his team if these things have been considered up front. I mean, I would just, um, obviously, as a lawyer, uh, I only see these as sort of conditions, precedent, you know, things that have to be delivered. But my experience with the various brokers in the market, you know, they're not all created equal. If you can't have the team around you, it's definitely worth considering, you know, your intermediaries and whether your debt advisors actually have the skill set, because they can sometimes produce these preliminary business plans that really go to some length is to explain the background and um you know the track record and the things that which is mentioning is a sort of initial outline which will help you to build so um you know it's something to consider if 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 you're struggling with that element and that often crops up uh with, with um developers who are first time developers they have bought and sold packets of land they have bridged and they have gone to bridges and they've gone to specialist bridging advisors in the uh, in the broker market but development is a completely different kettle of fish from uh, from and and if you go to the same uh, broker you might not have the right broker you you've got a bridging broker you haven't got a development broker and have you got uh, and if you are a, if you've always just bridged land purchases and building purchases and now you want to develop, what what suddenly makes you a developer? What, how come you can now think you can develop, which is a different skill set from just buying and selling parcels of land? It's a, there, there must be a reason that you think you can now do a development. And if putting an extension on the side of your house is not necessarily a good enough reason, if you see what I mean. And that's, I'm, I'm using uh, uh examples to make a case but uh, but there has to be you you must have brought someone in to your team who is uh who is who's got development expertise and that and they're the person that's going to deliver this thing for you absolutely that's, richard yeah. yeah a lot of um uh lenders only only lending to experienced developers in their fields um because, because of those reasons um i was going to ask as well uh richard you, you've mentioned a few <coughs> issues in the in the proposals in the in the paperwork um, but what other issues are you seeing as a as a monitoring qs and and how has your role changed um in recent months um, I, um, I don't know that it's changed it's emphasized slightly different portions um you would be amazed how many developments uh come forward with no contingency 
or with inadequate contingency. Um, you know, a, a scheme which is uh, barely designed having a 5% contingency, um, uh, we, it, it is not going to be large enough to be sensible, if you see what I mean. And for all the reasons of uncertainty that we've discussed already in terms of materials and what have you, um, so the, the emphasis on getting a reasonable contingency built in, uh, lots of lenders by default will build in a 10% contingency over anything that the developer says, just because they, 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 if you like, they're building in their own risk margin. That's a very sensible approach. And they will always have it in the facility, whether the developer wants it or not, just as a, as a deal. And it will still have to work with that 10% contingency assumedly spent. Um, that, but uh, so therefore that would lead a developer not to put a contingency in because he knows it's going to get put in uh, later on. And I do accept that. But, you know, know, know what your how your lender is going to play it. Um, and I think also there is uh, scrutiny on the insurances, the various insurances of the various different players in the deal, uh, be that uh, development insurance itself. But I'm also talking about uh, the uh, PI of the consultants. Uh, the, the, there is often the need to choose a smaller de designer, uh, both in structures and architect, because they are cheaper. And the reason they are cheaper is because they carry £100,000 PI. Um, PI costs have, in the construction industry especially, have gone through the roof uh, by factors of 10. Uh, over the last um, 12 months. Um, the, the, it's all related to Grenfell, evidently, and I'm not saying it's wrong, uh, but uh, you, have to ex you have to understand where the consultants are. They are paying 10 times more for their PI than they paid the year before, or where they used to carry 10, they now only carry five. Um, I know most lenders have a 10 or a 5 million pound uh, consultants threshold that they must be reached. Then again, you must ask yourself on the projects that you're lending to, um, when are you ever likely to be suing anyone for 5 million quid of the project? Um, you've asked them to get 5 million pounds uh, PI, but is that really going to be there? Um, that there has been 10 and five are the sort of minimum cutoffs that lenders will be looking for these days. But on a um, on a million pound uh, three unit residential development, I don't think your uh, architect necessarily needs that much um, uh, PI. And there, there, so there needs to be an, an understanding of that level. But um, so lenders might have to get used to uh, accepting lower PIs from their advisors and their consultants within the development, if you see what I mean. Um, because £10 million uh, PI cover for a project manager is unbelievably expensive at the moment, and preventatively so. Um, and whereas you might have got it two years ago, you might not get it anymore because they're, because it isn't available. Uh, to the same consultants, or if it is av if it is available, it is available at preventative levels. So I think so. Insurances has been there has been a major uh, uh, look at, um, and of course refocusing on cost and time. Richard, on that side, I mean, what I've seen a little bit is maybe a slight increase in either the scope or the regularity of your reporting from QSs in Speeding that up, or you know, rather than having you on a very limited kind of scope, kind of expanding that. Is, have you seen that? Yeah, no. Uh, well, I still, I mean, reporting is generally a monthly basis because that is generally how often uh, the contract. It all goes back to how often the contractor needs to be paid, and therefore the contractor gets paid on a monthly basis because the JCT says so, uh, or the contract says so, and therefore that triggers a drawdown, uh, which triggers a site meeting, which triggers a, a, a visit to the site. Um, now, it may well be uh, that um, the lender isn't actually lending till month four because he's only lending 60 percent. And uh, the, uh, they can, but of course, even though there's no drawdown in the first four months, 
um, I would still suggest that it would be a very good idea to go and inspect on a monthly basis because you have a charge over this site and the, and the lender would like to know what's going on to the uh, site over which he has a charge. Even though there's no lending going on yet, uh, no more lending, I presume there, was, there might well have been some early on, but uh, they, they, some lenders do not insist you go for that period of time. Uh, I would always recommend that I think it's a good idea that we should go and produce a report. It just won't have a drawdown amount in it because we haven't got to that threshold yet. And who knows, it may be delayed uh, the, the, to get the expenditure up to the, to the drawdown level might be delayed a couple of months too. And I'm sure uh, the Treasury Department of the bank would like to know that they won't be actually lending any more money to it for a further two months. True, true. And I think I think what you're describing is is definitely what I'm seeing in the finance documents, legal documents, the regular reporting and and the expectation there. And it goes hand in hand with as a developer on the borrower side, if you want that flexibility, you know, and you want that engagement and you want a collaborative approach, then that's part and parcel as well as the hardening market. Um, you know, good contractual behaviour includes monitoring. Um, and if you're going to try and push out events of default and try and push out triggers then equally you've got to give on the monitoring you know more than we expect to be reporting more uh, and that's what's happening and um, just following on from from richard's point about the the hardening pi market we we've, we've definitely been seeing that in the, from the surveyors um over the last couple of years um but but it's interesting to see that it's, it's also affect, affecting other other parties in the development uh, chain um john what's your what's your opinion on that um in terms of that kind of disconnect between lenders and the actual pi that's that's required yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. Um, I think alongside the PI, I often see in in some monitoring supplier reports, uh, and it's probably along the same lines where they, they put a generic comment in regarding maybe collateral warranties or generic comment in regarding rights of light, um, and and then when you kind of credit team or or when it's being reviewed internally you then kind of have to then kind of bat away for for good reason or take on board that you may need collateral warranties uh, and then that goes back to the PI cover again so then you're, you're looking at the PI cover you're asking the solicitor and uh, and the monitor have, is the PI enough it may have to go up and uh, and as you quite rightly say we've seen PI cover uh, costs go up both in uh, in the development world and in the surveyor world, so it's um, it's ripe at the moment, and it probably is Grenfell um, related. Um, but yeah, I don't think many people appreciate when they when they go back to their their broker a year later and their their costs have gone up two or three times. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of hear what Richard thinks about collateral warranties on on smaller to medium developments and and rights of light as well. Is that just kind of standard in your reports now, or is that something that you're actually kind of worried about and a key point? Oh, just covering off rights of light. Well, I mean, we, we will we will discuss the rights of light if there is a right of light issue in a, a deal. We will uh, similarly party wall, but on a, a standalone uh, house or series of houses, there are probably new build uh, development. There are probably no uh, rights of light or party wall issues. Uh, um, but if they're there and uh, these are these things to uh, discuss, we will, of course, read the reports uh, and comment upon the reports and see if there's anything restrictive within the uh, agreements that come out of them. Uh, I would like to think that if there are reports, we would also share those with the lawyer um, to, to, to read the finer points of the legal ease surrounding that. Um, in terms of collateral warranties, collateral warranties are always a, a collateral warranties are just there to change a uh, a duty of care into a contractual relationship from a, from uh, and, and that's fine so they've always got the duty of care um, I I don't know of too many organizations that have ever been sued by their collateral warranty uh, it would be very interesting to know uh, how many have um, I mean, uh, as a consultant, we collect, we, we file collateral warranties away and sign them left, right and centre. Um, that, you know, we have a right to review them. They're fairly standard wording these days. The, the JCT has a version of them. Uh, they're there and they, they cover materials left, right and centre. Often 
uh, all sorts of uh, consultants are asked to sign collateral warranties and of course uh, uh, design subcontractors uh, the, the the roof trust manufacturer the the um, uh, piling subcontractor etc the m e contractors are all signing these uh, collateral warranties I don't think many of them fear them mm, it would be and interesting the reason they don't, the they don't fear them Alex or, or Phil, but how, how many times they enforce upon collateral warranties, or, or is, is it, as you say, they, they go in a draw once they're signed and, uh, and that's the end of them? Because I think that is one of the key points that that, that maybe the PI insurers um, are looking to insure against. Yeah, I think there's sort of two things here. There's the expectation and the reality, and also don't forget that collateral warranties have the step-in rights, which again, it'd be interesting to hear yeah. how many people really use the step-in rights. There's probably other ways skin a cat but um yeah it, it doesn't i haven't seen it too often um including with stepping um there's other things that can occur especially if you've gone so far down the track and you're in an insolvency situation you know putting an administrator in might be a better way to deal with things and depending on how far you are from the end from pc you know it might not be the right route but the question you've got to ask yourself is when you come to a funder, what do they expect as part of their package? And also, if they're one of those secondary lenders who then want to transfer their loan into another lender or equally, you know, what tenants might expect, et cetera, all the other sort of related collateral warranties that you might get, you know, they, they will be asking for them, you know, if you build this, this, um, to get thinking more commercial, I'd say probably, you know, build something commercial and uh, you transfer it on, then there might be questions as to where is this collateral warranty for the, for the roof, you know, that you did or, or whatever, you know, something structural. So um, they are, it's questionable until you need it, I suppose, but also because it's expected um, and you can generally get them, you kind of say well why not but uh, i appreciate the background with the hardening pi market because that's definitely i'd say covid has accelerated what was happening you know as we've all said grenfell has had, had a big impact and you know if you read the fine print as to what you're getting you know before you get each and every claim in sort of five million that might be enough but now you're seeing in the aggregate and, and things like that so there's real changes happening because of the costs and um uh, I'd say probably lenders are being trying to be more selective and say, well, what are the core collateral warranties I need? You know, the key design structural guys. Um, and, and, you know, it is a question to work closely with your PM and get that advice there um, as to, as to what, what's required. Yeah, I think I mirror that. If, if you're down to arguing over the collateral warranties, you've probably got some bigger problems <laughs> with the site. And yeah, the, then usually it's yeah, probably past the point of no return then. So, yeah. Phil and, and Alex, um, just moving on to the, the, the development contract itself, um, what would you say are the, the main legal pitfalls in these um, before and, and at the end of a development loan? Alex, well, um, yeah, sure. Um, well, I sort of three things I sort of broadly talk about. Firstly, is is and we've kind of touched upon some of this title is is a big one where you know people before a loan may think they can look at the title themselves and take a view or get indemnity insurance for most restrictive covenant issues. But really, you need to bottom out those things properly. Advice. Um, and especially if a lender wants to track back the paperwork and see what you've actually disclosed to uh, an indemnity insurance provider, that can be a real problem. We mentioned rights of light as well, very um, specialised and it can have a massive impact on what you're doing. So that kind of stuff really needs to be looked at. Um, and the other obvious thing, and I'm not a tax lawyer, but it's, it's tax that can, that can really throw out all the structuring of what you're doing and the approach, particularly with options you know the classic thing is not to get caught out with the sdlt when that's triggered and whether you've got a land transaction that is taxable so when you enter into the option agreement and then when you exercise it or when you assign it or vary it so these are little things before you even get going you should just make sure you understand where the triggers and, and the risks lie um i think the other the third thing really is the contracts themselves which we've kind of spoken about uh, a little bit so around sort of stepping rights and collateral warranties. One thing that invariably developers maybe need to do more 
is try and do as much as they can back to back, by which I mean when they're lining up their, their sort of development contracts, they should be thinking about involving the funder if they've got one in the background as soon as possible so that they can make sure there's an alignment between the collateral warranties and the appointments. And often you have the appointments attaching the collateral warranties, the forms that you'd like, um, and that they all work. So if you've got a termination provision, in your appointment that it dovetails into the collateral warranty so there's no kind of mismatch there and equally you know just flushing out things that we've already said you know development appraisals whether they all work whether all those things will, will fit together you know involving the fund sooner rather than later is actually really really helpful um, so that, that's something that can help and I suppose the other thing we can't avoid is COVID and, and the impact it's having on terms um, things like we're saying um, you know relevant events under the JCT and uh, rights to um, to delay delay things and I think it, it's kind of generally um, down to what the contract will say and force majeure will probably cover or even you might have a pandemic clause in there um, that would cover it anyway um, and I think generally people accept that you know that may cause delay but as we kind of come out of COVID how much you can you know, seek a rely how, how much your contractor can seek that advice for an extension of time is, is questionable, uh, especially as there's always that principle of mitigation, you know, as to how foreseeable um, something was, the delays that you're going to have. Um, but what developers need to be careful of, and, and you know, dealing in JCT and dealing with standard form contracts, you may not think you have to look at your your list of terms, but you really should, because what I'm starting to see is contractors trying to sneak in COVID expressly as something that can be used to ask for loss and expense in certain scenarios so triggering under sort of relevant matters in the JCT so um, you know you have to be alive to your contract terms still and um, just another basic thing to do with your contract is the uh, liquidated damages and just something that's quite a common pitfall is making sure you're very specific about what your liquidated damages are. Um, specifically, if you've got uh, try and do a catch all that can actually backfire on you because, you know, if you've got a, a list of, of provisions, which ones are the most material, if you've got ones that are less material and they trigger the same damages then you might say that's a penalty which as we all know is unrecoverable because it doesn't match up so you can't assume you know years worth of jct etc and especially in the current environment that you know things are really accelerating the changes that we see in terms that you can just you know assume that you've got the coverage you really need to look at your contracts yeah well i'll probably mirror quite what alex says there i mean uh, part of what i experience all the time is when people haven't planned for the divorce before they got married and the issues I have then in trying to unpick that and try and work it through. Uh, when you have deficient step-in rights in particular can cause huge uh, issues or need you to you know, really use the kind of sledgehammer to crack the nut and appoint as a receiver or an administrator because you haven't got that underlying control which a properly term contract would give you. Um, I think that's probably where I see the issues and yeah what Ali was saying, particularly around the, the remedies for breach and that the lads, you know, when that's not correctly done or there's areas of argument, um, what I find quite often is a, a poorly worded term on that is worse than no term at all because it gives a, the ability to argue. Um, I thought Alex would probably hate me for saying that, but that would uh, obviously keeps the lawyers busy but doesn't actually get the development done. So uh, for my side, I, I think that's that's what I'm, you know, those are kind of bits I see really. It's sometimes that focus on how do we deal with this if it goes wrong? Everyone's always focused on starting starting the deal, is actually building in those protections. And it works for the developer and the lender. If, if the contract's clear and we everyone knows what needs to be done, it's easier to work through problems if they occur. Yeah. Yeah, and a well-worded contract should bring the right people to the table at the right times. Um, I often think that with security packages, you know, guarantees being taken, you know the the substance of it a bit like we're saying with the pi if you're going to pursue it is there actually something there but i think guarantees and personal guarantees are more about bringing those people to the table at the right time when things need to be discussed yeah yes i mean I, one more thing for me trevor like mean do you give personal guarantees still on your um so i will 
yeah. So I will not give personal guarantees. I think that's a last century mechanism. Yeah. Uh, um, I think the legal piece is a is a real is an area that needs some radical surgery um, because it it traps all the parties. Um, the mechanisms simply allow conflict to manifest and people to draw uh, to draw quarters while the while the work's on site is just suffering um, you know the job of a developer is quite difficult enough I mean as a sponsor of a project you're having to marshal not just resources but you're having to marshal ideas you have you're having to manage consultants you're having to manage the whole piece I don't think developers are given enough credit um, and then for things to fall down as Phil has just said everybody's super focused to get on site because obviously money is time sensitive um, that's the only thing that we really sort of focus and and understand is is the time and the cost of money over the project and other things just get done in, in a way that aren't fully understood or fully um, is clarified. So you have this absurd um, situation, as I see, where uh, lenders quite rightly are focused on equity at one end of the spectrum and stepping rights at, at the other. And then in between, they're kind of super focused on, and this is a more recent sort of um, observation that I've had, that they are quite focused as when as to when and where they can feed up a trough again because it's fees, you know, you know, um, loan extensions that, and the like it are, you know, huge events, uh, you know, that allow the finance houses to, you know, impose significant fees. So that's an issue. And then, of course, um, I think someone said, I think it was Alex, and, and I, I think maybe Phil has said as well, the LDs is an appalling situation. I mean, um, LDs are not thought about in terms of the quantum that might be suffered when things go wrong. They're often expressed as a, almost as a weekly rent loss type situation. Um, and maybe in the past, it was sufficient to rely on that. Now that things are much more contentious, lots more things go wrong contractors are much more savvy i would i would contend that contractors have as much legal understanding of the jct as most lawyers um, they know how far to push the boundaries they know when to escalate you know when to retreat and all of this just means that um, contractors are feeding on developers profit in terms of they are taking some of that the lending houses are taking some of the developers profit the developer is in the middle trying to manage and execute a project but in a way is being kind of you know um, impeded by what the contract says he can or, or cannot do and those are my own very real observation um, in the space being at the sharp end of, of you know, having to work with contracts, having to sponsor projects, um, having to refinance, watching, um, uh, you know, contractors, you know, just walk off into the sunlight when you thought you had a very good claim for X and it gets kind of crunched down in arbitration to Y. And, and Trevor, do you think, so I was going to just say, because, you know, COVID, at the start of COVID, you know, there was a lot of um, people like the Construction Leadership Council were saying, you know, be collaborative. And I think, you know, all the dispute resolution mechanisms were down for the Q2, Q3, I think I read. Do you think that nothing's going to come out of COVID in terms of, you know, new practices? Do you think people just go back to, you know, the, the polemic yeah. way that the industry can be? Yeah. Uh, um, um, sadly, yes, uh, you know, I, I see some green shoots, you, you know, 
I mean, if we stand back and, and look at our sector, I mean, essentially a developer is, is a, you know, is a sponsor. He has to have a good grasp of the space. He has to have a good grasp of legals, finance. Um, um, he has to have a good grasp of, you know, what can be built and demand. And those are quite wide ranging skills that many other, um, you know, so you, of the other team just don't have, you know. So you have one person trying to think broadly, you have the other actors thinking in silos, and and trying to manage that is really difficult. And we can use words like collaboratively, you know, what does that mean? Uh, you know, you work well until there's an issue, you know, and then you draw for cover. Um, you know, I like working with people that I like because I know one of the things I learned when I was living and working in the Far East, um, their mentality is um, you need to understand someone um, to the extent that when issues um, arise, they're going to roll their sleeves up and get stuck in to resolve you know, the matter that's at hand, not simply just rely on a contract to do the heavy lifting. Um, and as such, um, and that's a very different mindset to work in than what we have here, and I think it leads to many outcomes. As to where our sector is going, I I don't see a a a rush, Alex, to um, you know either I'm co-producing, I'm collaboration or indeed understanding some of the metrics around ESG, which will allow us to actually think about things in a compounding way rather than in a linear, well, this is my bit and I and it's my duty to safeguard that rather than worry about the bits either side. Um, just to um, uh, just to mention a, a comment that someone from the audience has said yes. about the personal guarantee comments about being last century, um, they they disagree and think that it's absolutely essential component for for a lender. So I just wanted to get just before we we uh, we close <laughs> this discussion an opinion from from John and yeah. then just follow up opinion from Trevor. But um, John, well, what's your opinion? Do you do you think these are essential? Um, for for us, at commercial acceptances and, and close brothers, yes, they're they're essential. We we wouldn't wouldn't lend funds without a, a personal guarantee in place. Um, we're effectively saying that we're putting the the, the larger percentage of the funds in. Um, we want you to to be fully involved and, and fully bought into the scheme yourself. Um, and you signing a, a personal guarantee for the funds that you're borrowing um, show gives that that, that kind of um, uh, that kind of thought process um, and shows that you're brought in. So uh, for us, it is, is a key element. Uh, and I suppose a lot of people probably sitting there listening in would would know that most lenders would ask for it. So it, it may well be kind of last, last century and people will have their thoughts on them. But I imagine the vast majority of people looking for development finance will struggle to find a lender who, who won't ask for a guarantee. Thanks for that, John. Um, we are three minutes past twelve, and we we definitely had some more more points to cover. But um, as as always, this this hour always goes very quickly. So um, I, I will kindly need to bring the event to a close. But if anyone does have any questions, um, please do email me at beth at medianet.co.uk, and I can pass those on to the to the panelists after the event. Um, it was a fantastic discussion, um, and, and some great, great answers and opinions to to some of the questions that I had. So thank you very much, um, and also thank you to to Adair and, and FRP Restructuring Advisory for partnering with us on this. And um, thank you to our fantastic panel for taking time out of your, your busy schedules to be here. And I also want to thank you, our audience, for joining us. Uh, we will be publishing this roundtable in full next week on development finance today for those that weren't able to make uh, the event or if you missed any parts today. Um, and if you enjoyed this one, please do check our virtual roundtable calendar on DFT. Um, we 
are holding events every week this year. Um, and also for more insights and news on the specialist finance sector, please check out the latest issue of the print bridging and commercial magazine, and which we also have an e-copy on BNC. Um, but otherwise, have a fantastic afternoon and we hope to see you more in person soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.